Hello, this is Haku the Bean, and we are moving on to level one of the back rooms, known as the Habitable Zone. This back rooms level is known for being safe, secure, and having a minimal entity count for a survival difficulty of class one. Level 1 is the second level of the back rooms. Level 1 is a massive warehouse with concrete floors and walls, exposed rebar, dim fluorescent lights placed on the walls, and a low hanging fog with no discernible source. The fog often coalesces into condensation, forming puddles on the floor in inconsistent areas. Unlike level 0, this level possesses a constant supply of water and electricity, which allows indefinite habitation by wanderers providing that appropriate precautions are taken. It is also far more expansive, possessing staircases, elevators, isolated rooms, and hallways. The fluorescent lights at any time can flicker or turn off for minutes or even hours. When this occurs, hostile entities may appear. These enemies rarely attack in groups and tend to avoid light. If the lights turn off, it is strongly advised to try and navigate your steps. Try and avoid any strange noises and find a room. Make sure to bring in a light source with you. Crates of supplies appear and disappear randomly within this level, often containing a mixture of vital items. Food, almond water, Batteries, tarps, weaponry, clothing, medical supplies, and nonsensical objects, assorted car parts, boxes of crayons, used syringes, partially burned paper, live mice, mice in a, a catatonic state that have been injected with unknown substances, shoelaces, loose change, and bundles of human hair. The crates should be approach with caution due to their contents, but are a valuable resource. In addition, crude paintings and drawings with no apparent origin or meaning can appear on the walls and floors. <sighs> they are known to change in appearance and disappear when non-direct line of sight when unlit. The light fixtures within level 1 are prone to flicker and fail at inconsistent intervals. When this occurs, supplies are liable to vanish inexplicably and hostile entities may appear unexpectedly. These entities rarely attack in groups and tend to avoid light and large gatherings of people. It is advised to carry a reliable light source and sleep holding whatever items you do not wish to lose. Level 1 also serves as the entrance to the hub. Not that hub. Beings typically lurk in level 1, especially when the lights are off. Known beings on level 1 include dollars, adult facelings, hounds, skin sealers, and scratchers. I don't think I could find a scratchers article. I'll look into it. Colonies and outposts. There are currently eight known colonies and outposts in level one. It should be noted that attempting to meet up with these colonies will extremely difficult as the back rooms stretch out for millions of miles and some of them may not exist now. Some may not have existed at all. The Raiders, recently discovered group with, a, with an expected number of 68 eight members. Almost. That kind of fire. Anyway, they are most friendly with regular travelers and are willing to trade, but will shoot down members of certain groups. Currently, they're not very strong, so they get knocked out after being suspected of making an alliance with the party goers during Operation End Party. Apparently, the main objective is to 
eradicate every big group in the backgrounds, claiming that adding corruption or politics in the backgrounds would make it an even worse place. They plan to get bigger and bigger by stealing and taking over colonies and outposts. This, however, failed when they tried to steal outposts fun time. Although recounts don't show this, a camera footage has been found. Six raiders were killed in this incident. This led to this led to MEG to believe that they were making an alliance with the party goers, so they were recently destroyed in the battle of Midtown. Ace flickers, this ace flickers of the backroom colonists, relatively a small base, owned by the main group, running in the open into trade. Population ranging from 25 to 200, depending on the number of people stationed there. Usually used for fandom or Reddit posts by people there. Has internet access. Odds and inter interacts with other outposts or bases is in this level, mainly the Republic of Level 153 and the Orderly Republic. Republic of Level 153, Outposts of Republic. Public of 153 has around 40 members, takes in survivors, and this is since the creation of the Republic of Level 153, has bounties or certain entity, on certain entities, has around 60 guns and 3 machine guns. Genesis is Labs, Base Alpha, large outpost, friendly and open to trade, studies the population of entities, analyzes and collects their DNA examples, and one of the largest level 1 outposts. The Orderly Republic, this is the largest outpost in level 1, consists of mainly young adults. Quite friendly, always open to trading. Guide Outpost 03, second in outpost of the a tourism guide and second largest outpost in level 1. Heavily armed at all times due to entities. Normally open for trading except for during search and rescues. Open for staying with them for safety for a week or so in exchange for small amounts of supplies. Sanction. <sighs> Previously hidden behind a false war, roughly 98 meters or 321.522 feet southeast from the exit. Devastated by unknown entity or entities. No member is found, but noises are common when near the false wall. Some still claim to see the residents and even talk to them, only people who didn't know the fate of these ancient report seeing them. Strange markings on the walls claim to have a cult with being reborn as their objective. Considered a lie by most, most people still talk to them and prove that they aren't lying by ruling things only they would know. Easily recognizable as all the, all the documented members have a scar on their left cheek. Oasis Lyra of the OFSCB Accommodates, supplies, and recruits wanderers. Population is approximately 130. The supplies are dependent on supply chains. Not open to trade, but are willing to supply travelers passing through. Level 1 has many entrances. Opening ordinary doors in May, any levels has small chances, small chance of leading to the level. One is able to enter this level from level 0. <sighs> no clip in level 1.5 to enter this level. That's a sub-level. Unstable, excuse me, unstable flooring in level 3. 13 indicated by visible odd textures the floor possesses may lead to this level if one can no clip through it.
One connects to level 1 by simply continuing to explore back rooms. Level 1 usually leads to level 2, or back to level 0. Other methods of exiting the level are as follows. An unlocked door may lead to level 2. The hub can be accessed from this level, in the entrance of level 1. Head straight down the corridor and stop at the door. Go through the door, then continue until the end of that corridor. Then double back to the entrance of the level. There should now be a diverging path that goes left or right. Take the left. There will be another divergence. Take the right. Then the next one, take a left. And the next one, take a right. As soon as the right path is taken, the path will lead to two doors, labeled A and B. Take the B door. Upon going through the door, the new room will look identical to the last one. Now take the A door. This is the door that leads to the hub. If any of these steps are completed incorrectly, like take wrong, the wrong turn, or not double, doubling back, one may end up somewhere completely random. No clipping through walls that, may, that have outlets may lead to either level 229 or level 188. Rarely, falling asleep in this level may lead to one of the bedrooms in level 1950. There are a few entities that were mentioned and to be on this level. And I think the hub might be something that needs a bit more explanation. The hub, survival difficulty class zero. It is safe, secure, and devoid of entities. The hub is a secret level or area serving as the nexus of all levels in the back rooms. The hub is a vast subterranean complex composed of an infinite interconnected network of tunnel systems. It serves as a nexus to the entire back rooms, containing an entrance to each level. Every tunnel is lined with evenly spaced doors. The design of each one representing the level it leads to. There is only one door for each level, they will have a certain number. Every door can be unlocked with its respective level key, labeled with a number corresponding to that of the number on the level door. However, all doors to have previously been manually unlocked always become locked again for any subsequent entrance into the hub. Only a small a handful of doors remain permanently unlocked, those being levels 1 and 11. <sighs> In the center of this tunnel network is a place called the Temple. It is a structure with distinct Greek Roman art architecture, serving as a house of worship to the key master. An imposing marble statue erected in the likeness of the Keymaster lies in the temple's main hall. Cultists of the Keymaster congregate here to pay tribute, when you do so in the hopes of receiving a level key to one of the hub's doors, while others hope to be unlocked by him, receiving blessings and boons which grant them immense power. I think this is enough for now we can go over this in depth another time now i believe it's time that we went over the dollars NC Hazard Class 4 NC Number 6 Habitat Majority ND6 is known as Dolors. They are darkly contrasted humanoid entities 
featuring long arms with skin similar in texture and appearance to tar. Descriptions of the physical appearance of dolor seem to vary, but the most common description is lack of major or sensory organs, eyes, ears, and nose. The substance of the skin is composed of is in a constant state of toggling from liquid to solid, making it slowly drip down. down. Dolors can melt and reform their bodies, usually as a trap to catch prey. They range from them being more liquid than normal to be in a gray puddle. Oh. Do not go near any dark puddles that you may find, as it is, as it is most likely a trap by a dolor. If you go near it, the dolor will form an arm out of the puddle, quickly wrap it around you, and pull you into the puddle. Those who have went into the puddle were never seen again. Well then, you become docile and start hunting again after a few days. This is seemingly because dragging victims into the puddle is how dolors eat, and that would be enough to feed them for a few days. The theory is unconfirmed but highly likely. Dollars, when not in a hunting mode, will usually wander around levels and explore them. Dollars are easily frightened when docile, and usually run away from anything they see as a threat. When in a hostile state, they melt themselves into a puddle. When anyone gets to know who close, they will make an arm appear out of the puddle to grab the victim and pull them in, and most likely eat them. Once they catch their prey, they reform back into their normal appearance and turn docile again. Dollars, as said above, are humanoids made out of thick gray liquid that slowly drips from their bodies. They are missing several features a human and would have, like ears and hair. There is a dark hole where their eyes, nose, and mouth would normally be. They are a bit faster than most entities and even humans. It is not fully understood how a dollar's biology works, as they don't seem to have any bones, muscles, or even organs due to the fact that they can melt and salt, solidify their bodies. They can take the shape of almost anything their size. This has caused reports of noticing dollars in different forms, such as a slug-like creature or an oversized insect. Sometimes, dollars can be lighter or darker than the others, but the most common is a dark gray, a close but still undifferentiable to black. The first report of a dollar was in 1979 when a group of two wanderers were, were exploring an unknown level. When they fought on a dark puddle, one of the explorers stepped on the puddle and got sucked into it. The other wanderer ran away when a dollar in its humanoid form started arising from the puddle. Next, we have facelings. <sighs> Entity hazard class is variable. Facelings are a general term for faceless people that roam the backrooms. There are multiple types, each with different levels of hostility. They are one of the most populous entities in the backrooms. And likely, one of the first entities one encounters. The most common two forms are adult facelings and child facelings, although more have, been, have since been discovered. Adult facings have the appearance of a standard adult humans, except for facial features. They can appear as male, female, and can also appear completely androgynous. They either wear former clothing or clothes most adapted to the level which they appear in. Child facings are mischievous and hostile. They often appear in groups of two to three 
and will torment and attempt to kill survivors they encounter. Child facings are almost always female and brandish small, sharp objects. These typically are small pieces of sharp metal or small knives. If confronted by I touch, they will fall asleep, resulting in them getting distracted. However, seeing one is not always an attempt on your life. They will sometimes try to scare survivors or even pull humorists as pranks on them. Due to the number of facings present throughout the back rooms, significant mutations can occur to those entities. Many different entities that arrive from facings, some of these have actual mouths, eyes, and noses, and, and might totally differ from a regular facings. <sighs> Old Man Facelings These facelings walk around with a cane and appear to have wrinkles indicating age on their face. They are very slow and, while harmless, will attempt to check you out. They will touch your face and body to attempt to figure out what you are. Just briskly walk away if you don't want that. Polygonal facings. Similar to adult facings, but with a polygonal-like body. They have the texture of plastic and emanate a sound similar to static. Polygonal facelinks are the result of a facelink that no clips. Shadow facelinks. A pitch black facelink. These facelinks appear like a silhouette, but are actually corporeal. They are extremely hostile, but are only as strong as a normal human. Behaviors. As for as aforementioned, the facings can be divided into adult and child facings, and their behaviors also differ depending on their age, and actually sometimes even just depending on what level you might find them in. Adult facings are friendly and do not act with hostility unless provoked. They are quiet individuals and generally avoiding interaction with humans and other entities. Rarely seen exploring levels, most of them live a said and their life throughout the back rooms. Child facelings are usually mischievous and, and hostile. They often appear in groups of two to three and will torment and attempt to uh, uh, kill the survivors they encounter. If attacked, adult facelings will try to protect them and begin to act hostile to the, a wanderer. They only appear friendly to younger or wanderers if lost from their groups. They will search an, an adult facing as protector, as protection. Facings are one of the first Arsenides ever discovered in the back rooms. One of the earliest mag reports ever written referenced them. Journal entry is referencing facing things date back to the year 2004. Their exact reference is still unknown. Rumors say that an inhabited in the backgrounds before humans explored it, but no report reports back this hypothesis. So, most likely you aren't going to get hurt by facelings if you don't mess with them too much. Unless they're chill, wild facelings. Hounds in the Hazard Class 4. Hounds are nude humanoid entities with unkept black hair on their heads and large mouths filled with sharp teeth. They have long bony limbs, sharp claws, have eyes that are fully white, lacking irises or pupils, and walk on all fours like a dog, hence their name. They are some of the most or common and hostile entities but in many levels of the backgrounds are less common in the deeper levels. They are extremely dangerous and become agitated when they see someone in a hostile state, but can be intimidated. 
Avoid hounds at all costs, even if one is in its neutral state. Hounds will hounds become hostile the moment they see a human. However, they will be intimidated and momentarily stalled when you stare them down. If you hear hounds growling, it is best to stay out of sight and get out of the way for a while. <sighs> hounds are quadrupedal humanoid creatures with long black hair growing on their heads. They have razor sharp claws and extremely large mouths filled with knife-like teeth. The pearly whites often go unseen until it is too late for you, though, as their lengthy dark hair usually hides this feature. As mentioned above, they walk on all fours and have a surprising amount of power when they attack a target, despite appearing sickly skinny. They appear to have a skin condition that resembles mange and are observed scratching or gnawing on their skin to rid themselves of itching. Their eyes are fully white, giving off the impression of blindness, but don't be fooled. Hounds can see normally and are capable of seeing in the dark. These entities hatch from eggs that originate from the hive. It's imperative to wander survival that they avoid getting bitten at all costs, as their saliva contains a, a disease, dubbed hound virus. That will infect and turn the bitten into a hound as well. Incubation and periods can last from 5 to 7 minutes. Symptoms are as followed. Discoloration or burning rash around the bite wound. Migraine. Rabies-like symptoms. Difficulty swallowing, foaming at the mouth, etc. Lightheadedness. Mild to intense muscle spasms. Which can also lead to cramps. Increased aggression, stomach cramps, vomiting, mange like skin disease that covers the body. Approximately 20 to 30 minutes after symptoms appear, the infected its body will reconstruct to match up a hound. The process is visibly and auditorily excruciating as normal human's teeth and now also painfully pushed out and replaced by fangs and paws, where his hands and feet are reconstructed to more to move exclusively on all fours. Amidst the transformation, rapid hair growth will occur on the body and eyes lose pigmentation. Afterwards, they will enter a feral and hostile estate, complete in transformation. If one is bitten, it's best to either isolate as far away a from or outright unalive the afflicted, as there is no known cure at the time, though efforts are being made. One an experiment attempted leading to unsatisfactory results. Discussions of the may lead to with the idea of the idea of reversing engineering the rabies vaccine as a means to co of combating the virus. Though lacking a confirmed year, amputation can prevent transformation, but must be done within one to three minutes, as the virus will begin to spread rapidly after this time frame. Fortunately, scratches from claws will not spread the virus, but will instead cause a burning, itchy rash around the wound, followed by a painful cramp. This can be easily treated by pouring almond water on the wounds. And typical first aid. Lastly, saliva making contact with wounds or orifices will also cause infection, so be cautious. Whew. One of the earliest known video recordings of the backrooms depicted a wanderer running away from a hound in an area that resembled level zero. However, since we don't know when the hive was spawned, if it even had a beginning, we can't determine the exact origin of hounds at the time. There has been few instances of hounds being tamed by facelings in level 92. Currently, humans have not achieved this. Now we move on to the skin stillers.
Entity 10, more commonly known as the Skin Stillers. Oh wait, I forgot to say. Entity Hazard, Class 5. The Skin Stillers are large humanoid entities that can wear the skin of their victims as a disguise. They eat human flesh when in a hunger state and otherwise roam if they do not eat. need to eat. Their blood is translucent and they can mimic human speech. They are most commonly found on the first four levels, but have been in reported in other levels. They have impressive physical abilities that seem to compensate for their poor intelligence. Skin sellers are typically docile creatures and will wander if they do not need to feed it. In, in this stage, it will not be hostile unless you aggravate them. In a hybrid state, they will seek out humans wandering alone and then use their strength to tear them apart with their hands. Skin sellers are tall, pale, and yellow humanoids with sunken white eyes. The outer layer of flesh is covered with microscopic bumps similar to the structure of an oct octopus's tentacle. These stick to skin and then turn off humans and push and pull on it to make it fit until the skin still looks identical to a human. These bumps also pump blood and nutrients into the skin to make it feel warm and alive as well as for decomposition. In addition, it heals the skin, hiding any cuts that may identify. And find a real human. After a period of around 24 hours, the skin will, will be digested through the surface of the skin cellar and the skin cellar will enter a docile state. It will last until their hunger for human flesh restarts. A skin cellar can also speak but can't understand our language. It will repeat what it hears often, and in varying languages, to learn prey, but it can't communicate. Although since this typical insular rarely uses a voice, this is not a good way to tell them apart from real humans. The blood of a skin there is a complete translucent, so a good way to identify a skin sealer from an old person is by their blood. Blood runs red, they're not dead. Blood runs clear, get out of here. Science of skin sealers have been re reported five years before the creation of MEG. As some of the most populous entities in backrooms, they are often one of the first entities wanderers will encounter. Oh, yeah. I want to talk about smilers and party goers. Let's do that really quickly. <sighs> Go ahead, ask yourself. What is a Smiler? The truth is that we don't know. Nobody knows. Smilers are an enigma, something that perverts our expectations of how a smile is put together, something that feeds on our primordial fear of the unknown. Speaking of uh, from experience, Smilers don't hunt humans for sustenance, a paranoia that we feel when meeting them satiates them enough. They kill because they simply love it. Paranoia. Paranoia and fear are their dinner, but cutting someone's life short is their dessert, if you will. That's from MEG Lieutenant Sigmund O'Connor. Class of this entity is variable, and they like dark areas within the back rooms, which, in almost every level, there's going to be some. There are lots of places where they can be, where it can be dark enough for a smiler to and have it. Smilers are an inscrutable species of mysterious entities, simply ident 
and a fireable by her crooked smile of softly luminescent white teeth, along with a pair of circular eyes. Regulation ends artistic depictions and proposals regarding the true physical appearance and anatomy of the smilers have greatly conflicted throughout the years. However, even after countless attempts to discover what the true body of these monstrous as look of the these monstrosities looks like, nobody seems to be to get a clear read on anything more than a smile and a pair of eyes. These ghostly alien beings are only spot in areas that are completely shrouded in pitch darkness, making it impossible to see anything more than their few bioluminescent features. Smilers tend to always stay a few feet above the ground while hovering in, in within their habitat. Their vocalizations tend to vary from snippets of human conversations, occasionally interrupted by static to children yelling or laughing as if coming from an old radio or a broken cassette tape. In hunting, smilers is the increasing opacity of their visible features until they completely disappear into the shadows. When not hunting, smilers are found substantially less, substantially less frequently than unusual, presumably resting within the darkness that serves as a territory. Those that are awake and not hunting tend to stay completely motionless and passive, not paying attention to passerby until hungry or in need of sport. <sighs> Smilers are widely regarded among wanderers as one of the most dangerous threats one can face during their travels within the back rooms, as these predatorial misanthropes are cunning hunters of men, able to flawlessly blend in with these supernaturally dim corners they lurk in and catch prey when they least expect it. They are commonly, very common in the back rooms. Their hostility and hunting methods vary from individual to individual, but often involve mutilation of the victim, precisely severing limbs and body parts. Some smilers have more sinister methods than others, preferring to stalk, chase after, and taunt wanderers, psychologically torturing them and encouraging them to mutilate or burn themselves before the predators themselves do it. Mental say is irrelevant when it comes to Oh, this form of torture being used by smilers to lead prey to commit suicide, to commit suicide, as even wanderers that are immensely stronger than expected can have their psyche destroyed by these malevolent entities. Proximity aids the smilers can cause a myriad of supernaturally in induced effects, both to wanderers and and in and inanimate and surroundings. They are able to distort footage, inflict muscle paralysis as on wanderers, and in some cases induce hallucinations that may lead to cardiac arrest. Those who have survived smiler attacks report mild migraines and auditory hallucinations that can last for years or even until death. Smilers often hunt individually, but are likely to hunt in groups or hordes depending on the number of their victims. Each smiler takes sustenance from the paranoia instinctively be triggered by their respective victim and end up murdering a single human each, often leaving only one member of the wanderers' groups to fend alone for themselves. <sighs> How a smiler is put together. Smilers are something that is made to humor our intelligence and mock the laws of reality, preferring the way we are known to perceive a smile, using a custom concept that us humans create as medium to induce fear and paranoia within our souls. A drastic a portion of those who know of the Smilers' existence agree that it is less of an entity and more of a physical di depiction of the primordial fear of darkness and the unknown. Our thoughts and profound fears are linked together to form something that predates that us. 
Prehistorically, people would have been more susceptible to predator or enemy attacks when in the dark. Smilers are a direct representation of this ancient and everlasting dread. Our mind creates monstrosities, monstrosities out of abstract concepts that, by all laws of, of reality, should not exist. Everything here is made to give wanderers more than in a simple illusion of fear, and smilers are but a prime example of this trait. <sighs> As mentioned before, there is currently no a photographic or video evidence of a smiler's true anatomy or body aside from the memorable features. It is very likely that smilers aren't ro an organic or robotic, but rather a form of spectral anomaly. Considering their common and physiological characteristics, if the fury that manifests as a representation of various emotions a water can feel is true, then one may consider it a topa or a sort of ghost. Artistic depictions and theories analyzing smilers and attempting to debunk the mystery behind their true form range from suggesting nice shapes to more unorthodox ones. The leaves may vary from water to water, but in the end, all the one can see is a smile as sinister as her intent. Smilers were first recorded by a group of anomalous of anonymous teenagers within level 1 around 1987. Although this is the oldest record of their existence, it is highly likely that these entities were discovered beforehand given how common they are within the backrooms. During their curious investigation into the noises they heard coming from an area of the level, these wanderers were attacked by a horde of smilers, resulting in the untimely death of three members of the group. The remaining member managed to escape and survive. Upon reaching an MEG base, requested a private interview session with the outpost head scientist to explain what he witnessed. A note was left by the wanderer summarizing the encounter. As for his request, the footage and the identity of the wanderer will be kept private. I was beginning to lose my sense of direction and time mentally. Turn after twist, twist after turn. I really had no idea what this place was, and neither did any of the other guys. I was never. I was too closely affiliated with them, but when and you're all when you're on a housekeep like this, you have so, you wouldn't say no to come to the company. They were quite nice, anyways. We've been trying to find an exit for a few hours now, maybe even a few days, maybe even weeks. Sixty seconds feels like an eternity here, and we've long given an up going on going back to our home. We're just trying to go somewhere that it looks actually safe. Suddenly, our bullhead of a kind-hearted. Self-proclaimed and team leader sites hearing something echoing in in a distance, like how a kid laughs after you tell him a really bad joke, followed by a burst of static, a really long burst of static. It seemed pretty far away, but it was startling enough for us. Heck, I can already hear one of us reloading his revolver. The group of leaders started running around and static continued to resonate, trying to find the source of the noise. Besides that, it would be a shame to leave his dumb as he gave us chase. So we went after him to help him determine where it was coming from. But here's the thing. It really was strange. The laughter sounded like it was coming from the west. When we head there, we start hearing... Oh, I read that. Start hearing it from the east. It went on like this for minutes. We were shouting random questions in the dark of the complex, only for us to receive no response. But that ear-piercing... In laughter. We said some words, shot some bullets, and the noise was practically running us in circles. Suddenly you hear one of the guys scream while took another around into one of those pitch black corners. Here's this place. Usually he did this to prank us and we would easily know he's faking it, but this time it was blood curling. Something definitely happened. So we all turned back in streaks, seeing some things flickering in the shadows. Like a bunch of smiles. I would say 
and human smiles, but they're way too large. Shrugging his luminescent teeth and all, the sound stops and the smiles stop, a flickering then, their eyes are opening up, each one has a pair of glowing, circular eyes, right above their smile. Revolver dude tries shooting on things again, but he runs out of ammo, drops his gun to the floor and curses. We're all paralyzed and have barely any weapons in hand. Heavily breathing, group leader ducks, extend and to shake your arm to grab the revolver. And before we expect it, something goes rushing at him. We didn't even have time to look at anything but the hole. The real mother effer of a hole, all these things pierced through his chest. His lifeless body was lying only a short distance away from our feet. Only a few seconds later, I hear something like a red, wet crack. I tilt my head at, at so hard it hurt, hurt like heck. But the shock I felt when seeing the revolver guy's body was also lying on the floor. His head severed off his body. It made the pain worse. I turned my head at again to see that the only other remaining teen was still staring at the leader's corpse. I could also hear him mouthing something. He looked at me, desperately trying to scream, to run, to snap out of this, this trance. You guess it. Next second, he was also lying on the floor. Snap up neck, then slipped off. The smilers got back into the darkness. That left me to fend blood for myself. Smart move. Now we're moving on to the backroom colonists. This page needs a rewrite, right, apparently, but we can still look into it. The backroom colonists is a a multi-nation and federation of the backrooms that has existed since the 1920s, with the group being formed around the, the Den and Capital, based at it in level 1. Since then, the backroom colonists have spread out, participated in many conflicts, and has lived through many of the down periods of the, of the backrooms. The current cap Capital is called New Cali and is in level 4. This group has around 1.2 million levels, mostly spread out between the bases and outposts. While it had, may while it had may wait, way more before the group has a whole challenge changed, most have left or cannot be found as of now. The group received a reformation, with many outposts and bases being scaled back and left out for others to claim, and any reformations in the terms, rules, and more. Group Info, Leader of the Kali Faction, Military, 4th or 100,000 in personnel. Total of GDP, 300 billion Cali dollars. Times unused. General backrooms time or front rooms time. <laughs> Currency, Cali dollars. Controlled old levels, level 987. The levels used to gather supplies, such as almond water and food. It first took over the place after it heard it was newly discovered. Has a joint occupation with the BLC on this level. Major basis. Level negative 10. Marble City. This is a small art post that was from the old group and recovered. They still use a house, party goers, and research technologies. Level 1, Almond Town. This is the main base of, at, at the level controlled by this group, and is the original base and capital for the first few years. 
that was renamed due to a reminder of the basics of life in the back rooms and one of those being almond water. Level 1. Flicker Center, aka Base Flickers. This is a secondary base at the level controlled by this group and is used to guide people while being mostly a stop off point nowadays. It was named due to the level's flickering lights. Level 4. New Cali. This is the capital of the back, Akron's colonists, and is used to command the entire group as a whole. It is mostly used for government buildings, technology, new testing, and a small industry as it's safe. Its name is suspected to be random or named after something in the front and rooms. Yeah, I can kind of guess what it's named after. <laughs> Level 4.7, Calibora. Calibora is an outpost that uh, is a base due to it having being associated and linked with New Cali, the capital. It's used for trading and a safety area back in the older days of the group. Its name is suspected to be named from a founding number of the outpost in Cali. Level 11, Skyline City. This is the main base at the level controlled by the group and is where most people in the group live. It's mostly used for that at an industry-like factories. Its name was suspected due to the skylines of uh, level 11. Level 153, Vintage Sect. The main base at the a level all controlled by the group it is so re relatively easy to reach during the beginnings of the group and has kept being and has kept a main base through the hub. Its name came after a level after the level being a vintage office. Level 290, Cinder Maze. A recovered outpost from, from the old group. It serves minimal purpose except exploration and having a small almond water stock and bunker area. Currently used more used to explore more herbs level and house people temporarily. Level 1237.1, New Adventure or Galley. A nautical outpost serving the, the purpose of documenting the level, trading, and helping wanderers, named after the front room's vessel, Adventure or Galley. Allies and Enemies. Allies, Genesis Labs, which we're going to read about right after this. Almond Water, or Incorporated, Backroom Helpers. Enemies, United Backrooms Authority. <sighs> Leadership and Hierarchy. The people of the Backrooms on this vote all at one of the main bases or outposts also leader at every 15th of February. During 1963 and onward, it became expected that essence or leaders should have longer than four years for an average term. In 1924, the first president of the colonists was Mina Lucas. He resigned in 1930 and ended. The next president of the colonists was Finney Caleb. They served for six years. In 1930, Finney Caleb served for five years before resigning in 1935 so that Jacob Dante could be president for four years until they died due to an entity. In 1939, Alex Graham was voted uh, into presidency for three years until they lost the next election. In 1942, Hudson Jenkins was president for five years before they died to an entity. 1947, Alec Taylor was president for four years before they lost the next election. In 1951, Toby Turk was president for two years before they lost the 
next election. In 1953, Glitch and Gray was president for three years before they resigned. In 1956, Hilly Cameron was president for four years until they died somehow during their term. In 1960, Gordon Thomas was president for less than a year and served the rest of Kelly Cameron team. In 1960, Han Kaiser was present for three years until they lost the next election. In 1963, Holland Pierce became president for six years before they died due to, to an entity. In 1969, John Fikes was president for five years before they resigned. In 1974, Candy E. Jenkins was present for eight years before they stepped down. In 1982, Badger Smith was present for six years before they stepped mm -hmm. down. In 19... In... Wait, Candy Jenkins was eight... 82, Badger Smith was present for six years before they stepped down. In 1988, Craig Crawford was present for seven years before they stepped down. In 1995, Tony e. E. Turing was president until they lost the next election for five years. In 2000, Prince Fleming was president for nine years before they stepped down. In 2009, Duncan Fikes was president for eight years before they stepped down. And from 2017 till further notice, Harding Fitzgerald is president. Department and Department of War and Affairs. I think you can guess that they covered the military and affairs being set mostly by military personnel and ambassadors. They are grouped together for simplicity. Department of Control and Expansion covers ministers, governors, and small registered groups that control all entities and secure here and form new outposts, and also they use to police 70 colonies. Department of Development covers the development of, of the outposts in terms of economy and, and usually runs government and own businesses, and also they can grant small funds to certain people for development. Department of Exploration covers explorer groups who discover new levels. Currently, they are trying to find any lost backroom colonist personnel from the old group or any outposts that were forgotten about. Last but certainly not least. Genesis Laboratories. This page apparently needs a re rewrite. But Oh boy. You know, at least with the description and maybe the history. But the conflicts and wars we might want to skip over due to that being a lot. Genesis Labs is a scientific foundation which focuses exclusively on researching biological information regarding in background amenities and overall bioengineering. 
Genesis also focuses on the future security and growth of the human species within the uh, backrooms, as many of the staff have lived, lived here for much of their lives. The headquarters established in level 141 provide ample space for expansion, even though uh, much equipment has already been transported to set at level. Being said, the complex at level 141 is used for sensitive research, as many of the rooms used have certain properties to a typical sterile surgery room. The cleanliness of the area also prevents infections such as hydroelitis plague from spreading too far, usually containing it in the room the patient is in. The Ensis Labs began as a small group called the Biologists in 1991 on Level 1, containing only a few hundred members. They originally focused on documenting entities and exploring new areas, but later expanded to collecting DNA samples was an autopsy. Genesis grew rapidly over the years as Bonners began to flee more oppressive and unorganized groups, such as the United Backgrounds Authority. The event drew the attention of the High Command of the United Backgrounds Authority, eventually escalating into armed confrontations as those negotiations broke down between the groups. Because Genesis refuses to forcibly repatriate any member that has fled, the laboratory is located in, in level 141 and focus on autopsy and collection of DNA samples. Genesis mainly focuses on common entities such as dollars, clumps, and sandies, pygoes, facelings, death moths, uh, uh, death rats, and the hydroelitis plague. Many breakthroughs on DNA structure and behavior of said entities have been made. Genesis also studies smaller suits having in one on, in the prison blocks. But not all information could be revealed as no autopsy could be conducted. Genesis researchers also gathered large amounts of information regarding the back rooms in general, the library, and level 230, such as information regarding behaviors of certain entities and the anomalous properties of certain levels. The backroom's pioneers eventually approached Genesis with the intention of creating a military alliance as both groups are occasionally created by the United Backrooms Authority. Genesis leadership quickly accepts as both groups are to benefit from having one another's backs. Genesis are its only use of 5.6 X millimeter or nano rounds as being universal amortization reduction safe. Apes production time. A few old guards of Genesis were originally engineers and weaponsmiths, allowing Genesis to produce its own fire alarms. The weapons they have are the SL 36, a variant of the Heckler, and Koch G 36, slightly more compact, like. Weight consists of a large magazine carrying up to 40 rounds, well suited for urban fighting. FMMVZ.28, a variant of the Minimi M249 hatchet, longer and heavier but now uses mostly plastic and aluminum components, designed for infantry support roles such as for icing fire and stopping light frontal assaults. RK-44, a variant of the Kalashnikov AK-19, not much has changed except for the wood structure, which are now switched to plastic structure, well suited for forest or jungle operations. ACL-R, a domestic design, ACL-R is a semi-auto bolt pop marksman rifle with 10 rounds for each magazine. This rifle has a very high muzzle velocity of 2 thousand and meters per second allowing accurate fire at huge distances. It's using 5.6 ammo. Fire rate is highly combined with accuracy but lowers the lethality of the shot. MG151 un unslash 20, a modernized version of the original MG151 slash 20. The airborne auto cannon. This weapon is designed for defensive purposes and fortresses. 
as auto 20 EM fragmentation rounds work well in almost all circumstances, gunsmiths were not able to produce a mobile variant. They used different variants of the Swiss Army life. Genesis militia with around 400, no, 40,000 men is the military and police force of the or organization, Genesis ground forces are stationed in bases. Accordingly, HQ has a garrison of 16,000 men, and each base has a garrison of 8,000 men. Genesis guards are not mercenary forces, meaning they are not for hire or to be used in foreign conflicts. Though the military may not be big, Genesis has the option to expand its fighting force in case of an anti infestation or attack by hostile faction as all personnel receive enough weapons training to not an end in the slaughter if actually sent to battle. Genesis outposts and bases are all equipped with defensive systems as Genesis does not focus on aggressive antagonism but remaining capable of defending itself. And we're skipping over the conflicts and wars to see Lab outposts and the relations. The headquarters is in level 141. They have base alpha in level 1, base beta in level 11, base gamma in level 36, base delta in level 188. It was apparently captured by the United Backrooms Authority, and the base at the in Nahum in level 230. Allies are the MEG as a research alliance, the Cairo Research Organization, and the Backrooms Pioneers as a military alliance. Their enemies are the United Backrooms Women's Authority. They're currently at war with them apparently. The Raiders, present on level 1, AEG kills all of these even non hostile ones and refuses to trade for in the NT corpses. X cast at war, kill everybody at war. <sighs> this was a long one. This has been an hour of me going through the organizations, entities, and other things relating to Backrooms Level 1. I hope you enjoyed. Please leave a like, a comment, and maybe subscribe and hit that bell on notification so you can and, and see more of this stuff. Until then, see you next time.